Thank you, Katrina. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm actually going to, to share my screen uh, a little bit, so hopefully that comes up okay. But um, uh, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. I'm not going to frame my discussion too much around COVID-19, but really I wanted to talk a little bit about my ideas for the future of work and how people analytics can inform our understanding of how jobs change and evolve and how we can perhaps start to get ahead of uh, the current environment to plan what the future might look like when we start to come out of this. Um, so obviously, I mean, the, the environment for, with respect to COVID-19 is an important one and one which we definitely need to take into account and it will provide the backdrop for innovation. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on that as we, as we go forward. Um, my name is Mark Lawrence. I'm the Head of Organisation and People Analytics at GSK. Um, I think GSK is a really interesting organisation because it's got a really rich and diverse history um, right the way through um, from initially selling uh, babies powdered milk all the way through to the, to the drugs and vaccines that we um, supply today and continue to innovate around. Um, when I look at the jobs and, and how they evolve over time, not just within the context of GSK, but in general, it really does um, spark the historian in, in me. And, and for those of you that know me, you might realize that my first degree was actually in history and archeology. span So this is actually a chance for me to bring out another passion rather than talking necessarily about people analytics. Um, but some jobs are ancient and enduring and, and picking up on Katrina's point there, you know, we can see that mentoring, for example, uh, we can look right back at the ancient Greeks um, for examples of mentoring but many jobs are not. For me, the history of work is very much the history of reflecting societal change. Jobs come and go, they change, sometimes overnight. For example, if we look at uh, jobs associated with the advent of microprocessors, you know, there was a whole industry spawned uh, within the space of a few months. Some jobs change over decades or even centuries if we look at things like soldiering or farming. Um, we can look at economic disruption, the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution. Um, we can look at political disruption. Many of you will, will immediately curl back in horror when I mention Cambridge Analytica. Um, but even that lead, led to a massive growth in the interest of analytics and the ethics around analytics. Um, so perhaps when we consider COVID-19 and, and all of the restriction around that, Perhaps we should also be considering the opportunity around that and how we can help to steward our organizations to be doing more relevant work in ways that are more in tune with the um, environment that we interact with and with the staff that we seek to, to employ. There's no doubt, however, that over the last 30 years, um, which ushered in the widespread use of the internet for recreational and work purposes, um, there's been, you know, probably the single most significant change and, and force for acceleration. The pace of innovation and change at the moment is just incredible. Um, this has led to more recent phenomenon of trend spotting. So if we consider the job trend spotters, this is a new job. This is something which didn't exist 20 years ago. And, and I first met a trend spotter in 2011, a, a chap called Magnus Lindqvist. Um, and he talked about the fact that actually trend spotting is very much an idea of having, an, having a, a good data set and using it in a way that will help you to understand the future. Um, now, where you draw those data sets from, whether that's the economy, whether that's um, a particular job that you're analyzing, um, actually it's exactly the same process that we use for um, people analytics. Taking data sets from multiple different sources testing them, looking for relationships, and then seeking to use those insights to understand not only the past, where we've come from, but where we might be wanting to get to in the future. Um, Philip Tetlock, Dan Gardner, um, uh, super forecasting, they talk about this becoming a science, the science of prediction. And then um, in 2018, Agarwal, uh, Gans and Goldfarb, don't worry, there will be a bibliography at the end for, for anybody that's interested, um, 
they really then consider the science of prediction to be to have become a branch of economics. So it's gaining academic weight and it's something which I don't think we can afford to ignore any longer. So when seeking to understand the future, we do need to consider where we've come from, as I said. Predictive analytics uses historical data, leveraging analytical models to provide a best guess or a probability of where we're going in the future. Um, the first major study when we look at the future of jobs is um, a 2013 study from the Oxford University. And right at the very end of that study, there is a list of 702 jobs and their probability to be automated by 2030. And you can see a, a selection of these on the screen now, hopefully. So when I looked at this list, you know, there are some, um, some surprises. Um, if we look down uh, somewhere near the bottom third of this list, we see accountants. Um, I'm sure many of us know accountants. Um, the amount of training uh, that they have to go through to pass their exams, to become trusted with an organization's finances or an individual's finances, actually to see that the probability of that job being computerized being 94%, actually that was quite a wake up call for me uh, when I first looked at this um, several years ago. Then, I mean, if you look further up the, the higher end of the list and we see um, historians, good news. Um, these are jobs which are not likely to be automated anytime too soon. For those of you that are interested in HR roles, um, actually many HR roles are also near the top of the tree here, not likely to be automated, primarily because it's those roles which really require interaction with and an understanding of individuals, being able to connect with our workforce. We've heard many of my, my colleagues on the call here today talk about the importance of understanding the employee voice and the employee experience. We're not yet in a position where we can consider how to automate the questions of understanding our, our sentiment of an organization. Yet we can start to put in place the kinds of solutions and systems that will help us to generate those kinds of data sets really, really quickly. So if we look at the first uh, table here, um, I've highlighted one row in orange, and that is pretty much 50%. So this is right in the middle. Um, could go either way, whether it's going to be um, report, uh, automated by 2030 or not. If we then uh, seek to look at the bottom uh, of the table, number 702 with a probability of 99% if you're telemarketer. So what I want to do now is use the telemarketer as a brief example to consider how organizations might start to consider those people who might be vulnerable um, in their organizations. And then think about how we can start to put in place a support mechanism for those people to help them see potentially that there is a future career path, even to actually show them in the most sensitive of ways, the risk of that particular job role when set against the, the fullness of macroeconomic trends. So how do we do this? The tele, telemarketer, we probably all have a, an image in mind, but moving away from the visual image, we need to understand what it is that makes up the role of the telemarketer and those people who perform strongly in it, those people who get reward from those kinds of jobs. So we need to hypothesize, what are the skills involved? What are the kinds of people and their attributes that we might expect to find performing those roles? Then we test those hypotheses. We gather some data that actually proves whether or not we're right or wrong. We might perform you know, various statistical analyses, uh, key factor analysis, uh, so on and so forth. But let's say then we get to a point where we have an understanding of what a typical telemarketer skills look like. And in this example, and this is very much off the top of my head, um, we are looking at somebody who maybe is self-starting, able to work independently, uh, somebody who may be able to work virtually in the way that we're all having to learn uh, now, somebody who might be good at relationship building, you know, quickly able to get uh, to build a rapport with a potential sales target, negotiation skills, tenacity, um, and creative thinking, the ability to 
not just take no for an answer, but to turn it round and, and present it to an opportunity. You might recognize these in, in you know, perhaps people that you know. For me personally, my very first job when I was at university was as a telemarketer. So this is something which, which resonated with me quite strongly. But what do we do with this information? Well, the next step is really to think about how we can start to understand the levels at which these are important and then understand where this might fit into the organization of the future. So we, alongside this, we also need to have an, an idea of what we want to achieve as an organization. Where is our business model taking us, not just in the next year or in the next two years, but in the next five, 10, 30 years from now? What are those roles that we want to imagine as being important for our organization? And how do we characterize those in terms of skills? Once we understand the skills related to a given role, we can then look at the gap in our current organization and we can compare it with those roles that are at risk of being automated and then it becomes a matching mechanism. So here, by looking at those skills, those people who are good at self-starting, virtual working, relationship building, et cetera, they might be our perfect candidates to fill our number one gap for the future, which is a personal relations advocate. Now, I have no idea what that is. It's a job I made up. And that's part of the fun of this game is, actually, if we look at the history of jobs over the last 30 years, there are so many jobs that didn't exist 30 years ago that do exist today. Things like personal trainers, um, things like uh, dog walkers. Um, so we have the opportunity now to start to imagine what our organizations are going to be needing for the future. And I've considered things like a 5G technician or, or a hospitality programmer. Um, and where these skills might provide a mix. From there, we can put in place a mechanism and a pathway to help move people through. And those first people to move through, those brave few, will be the ones to really blaze a trail to define what that's going to mean for the organization in the future and thereby get that first mover advantage and a competitive advantage over, over the market. So this stuff has real commercial value as well as being great for our people and great for the health of our organizations. That's just one idea. I realize it's taken a slightly different tack from others. As promised, these are the references uh, that you know, I just pulled out earlier on, but, um, but there are many, many more. And if anybody wants to take those up in the future, I'm very happy to connect offline. So this is your screenshot opportunity. Um, some of these are available by searching online, um, including aud audio books, which will be great for when if we head back into the daily commute. For now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Faye uh, from Mind, who's gonna give us some advice on managing good mental health.